Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks very much for that introduction. How's everybody doing? Uh, my name's Dave Clark, and I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about control and responsibility. Why is DevOps so successful, and where do we go from here? When I was given this opportunity to present, I couldn't pass it up. Some of the ideas I'm about to share with you have been rattling around my head for a while, and I'm really interested in any feedback you might have afterwards, um, perhaps over a cool beer later. So first, a little bit about what you can expect to take away from this talk. Um, my aim is to take you through why I believe DevOps is successful at addressing some of the fundamental issues that we see within our organizations. I'm going to try and convince you that DevOps is just the beginning and that we can extend this success to a, both a broader set of problems and indeed different classes of problem entirely. And a little bit on what this talk isn't. So I'm not here promising a magic recipe for success. Um, I really hope you'll gain something from being here, but as is often the case, there are no simple answers and I won't promise to provide you one. So who am I? As I said, my name's Dave Clark, and I'm currently working as a principal engineer at Pixel. Pixel are a metadata and OTT technology partner to some of the broadcast and media industry's biggest names. We think that metadata management is one of the biggest but least visible challenges facing our customers in the industry today. Metadata plays a huge role in viewer experience, discoverability, scheduling, and monetization, but many companies are struggling to use their metadata as well as they should. My background is as a back-end engineer, mostly working with Java systems. I've worked on video-on-demand platforms, platform-as-a-service solutions for mobile gaming, and in financial planning and analytics. Before we get into the meat of things, I'd like to take you on some of the journey that I've been through. And to do that, we need to go back several years. At the time, we were building a video-on-demand platform for a customer. We had both development and operations teams within our company working on this platform. Our dev team would work through customer requirements, build applications, and then throw those applications over the wall to our operations team. And they, in turn, made sure that those applications were running and serving traffic and generally doing what they were supposed to. I don't think there's anything particularly surprising here. I think it's a setup most of us can relate to at one time or another. If I were to draw it out, it would maybe look something like this. So here we've got a dev team, and here we have an operations team in the same company. Work is typically moving into the dev team, then getting passed over to the ops team once it's ready for production. This situation ticked over happily for quite a while. We were reasonably productive, um, and the relationship between these teams was relatively healthy. I was part of the dev team, and the operations team sat upstairs in the same building. It was easy enough to go and talk to each other when we needed to, and candid conversations were easy to have whenever that we had fires that needed to be put out. As tends to happen, this status quo didn't last forever. For various internal reasons, the customer decided they wanted to bring the operations aspect in-house. They spun up a team, we handed over, and our picture changed from this to something a little more like this. Where before we had two separate but co-located teams, what we have now are teams that are separated, not just geographically, but we're also looking at an inter-organizational boundary here. We were encouraged to maintain a good relationship across this boundary, and by and large we did, but it was interesting to see the dynamic change over time. The operations team were now part of the customer, and we had face to maintain when we were talking to them. It could have been a lot worse. Um, both sides were very professional, and our relationship was pretty healthy. But candid conversations that are sometimes necessary to put out that certain class of fires were more difficult to have. Where before we were we, now we were much more us and them. And this could be frustrating at times in, in both directions. So perhaps a change in the application logic impacted some runtime characteristic of the platform, and this wasn't communicated correctly, or someone tried to get better performance out of the system by tweaking this environment setting in production, and that in turn might have resulted in unintended consequences. We had both dev and ops teams represented in the on-call rotor, and as I'm sure we all know, when something goes wrong, it isn't always obvious who to get involved to understand why. This meant we could have one team's work resulting in call-outs for the other team, and they may have had no visibility or, or even awareness that any changes had occurred, and potentially vice versa. And it, it was this latter scenario that really started to grate. 
as the dev team, we found ourselves being called to account for issues arising from changes that were beyond our control. And I'm confident our frustrations were mirrored on the other side as well. It was at this time that I stumbled on an article by Zed Shaw called X equals control, Y equals responsibility. In this article, Shaw presents a key piece of advice aimed at management. Control must be correlated with responsibility. And Shaw defines control as the person in a situation making the decisions. And responsibility as the, re the rewards or punishments for the outcomes of those decisions. He covers this in the first few paragraphs, and while the rest of the article is well worth reading, this is the bit that really stuck with me. Control must be correlated with responsibility. He goes on to say that people in control tend to do whatever they want, and the person who's responsible is miserable, quits, goes insane, or stops caring. And this causes most of the conflicts in your organization. I don't want to sound too melodramatic, but this definitely resonated. It's not pleasant to feel responsible for something when it's outside of your control. Control must be correlated with responsibility. Shaw sure doesn't actually draw the graph being described, but let's take a look at what that would look like. Now, if you're really paying attention, attention <coughs> excuse me, you'll notice that I flipped the axes. Um, I've got control on the y-axis, not on the x-axis. There's, there's no good reason for that. I've been using this graph to illustrate this issue for a while, and at some point, I started drawing it this way around. I promise it doesn't, it doesn't change the meaning at all. So let's define these terms again. If you recall, Shaw said that control is the person in a situation making the decisions, and responsibility is the rewards or punishments for the outcomes of those decisions. I like Shaw's definition of control, defining it in terms of where the decision making occurs. But I'd like to offer a slightly different definition of responsibility. I'm not sure it's as clear cut as rewards and punishments. Actually, like Google's definition, responsibility is having an obligation to do something. Hopefully, you can see that you might end up in a situation where you have an obligation to do something, but without the ability to actually make the decision about doing it. Maybe you found yourself in this position before. Maybe you're in this position right now. I've read a few different variations on this theme. In Whitehall studies, researching the health and well-being of civil servants, Sir Michael Marmot writes, the high status person has a lot of demand, but he or she has a lot of control. And the combination of high demand and low control is what's stressful. The combination of high demand and low control is what's stressful. Marmot is using high demand to describe the obligation. I'm going to keep using responsibility, but hopefully this helps clarify the concept. So here I am, experiencing these frustrations, and finally I have a framework that I can use to express them. <coughs> a feeling of responsibility, but without the control. And it's around this time that I moved off that team. I went to work somewhere else that was already doing something pretty close to DevOps. My frustrations disappeared, and at this point I didn't really think much more about it. In fact, I'd almost entirely forgotten about this graph when I read the very excellent book Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. For anyone who hasn't read this book, I, I would really, really highly recommend it. Viktor Frankl was held in various concentration camps during the Second World War, and he went on to pioneer a branch of psychotherapy called logotherapy. Logotherapy is based on the premise that the primary motivational force of an individual is to find a meaning in life. It's a short book, but it is a real joy to read. The reason I'm mentioning it here is because of something he says towards the end of the book. He's describing the capacity of a person to change and having the freedom to do so. And he says this. Freedom is but the negative aspect of the whole phenomenon whose positive aspect is responsibleness. In fact, freedom is in danger of degenerating into mere arbitrariness unless it is lived in terms of responsibleness. So that, that's quite a mouthful. But what struck me was the description of freedom as the negative aspect of the whole phenomenon whose positive aspect is responsibleness. And this was, this was ringing some bells. So we have control, which is the person in a situation making the decisions, and responsibility, which is having an obligation to do something. 
And Frankl is talking about responsibleness and its counterpart, freedom. So I promise I'm going to stop throwing definitions at you, but let's just look at one more. Freedom is the power or right to act, speak, or think as one wants. The power to act. That sounds a lot like control. And Frankl says, freedom is in danger of degenerating into mere arbitrariness unless it is lived in terms of responsibleness. So let's go back to our graph. And I think we can start to annotate this a bit. So here, we have control or freedom, but no responsibility. And we get arbitrariness. This is where your cowboys live. If you're in this area, it's a bit like the Wild West. Anything goes, no one really has any responsibility. But down here, if you recall, people are miserable, quit, go insane, or just stop caring. Let's call this frustration. For the rest of this talk, I'm going to continue to use the terms control and responsibility. But actually, I, I really prefer freedom over here. I think it's got, a, it's got a much more positive sort of aspect to it than control. I, I hope you're all with me so far. Um, I've skated over some kind of big ideas here, and frankly, I could talk a lot more about Viktor Frankl and his ideas, um, but I promise to try and tie this into the future of DevOps, so we've got a little bit more ground to cover. Um, a little bit of a sidestep now, but how many of you have heard of the OODA or OODA loop? Can I get a show of hands? Okay, a, a few people, but it's not. It's not that, that well, well spread. So I genuinely had no idea how well known a concept it is across sort of this cross section of people. Um, and for the benefit of people who've not encountered it before, I'm gonna do a bit of a run through here. So UDA stands for observe, orient, decide, and act. And the UDA loop is a tool for decision making. Specifically, it aims to provide a process that will help individuals and organizations win in uncertain and chaotic environments. The UDA loop was developed by Colonel John Boyd, and I highly recommend Robert Coram's biography, Boyd, the fighter pilot who changed the art of war, if you want to dig any deeper into this. It gives a really excellent overview of Boyd's life, and it goes into a fair amount of detail on Boyd's contributions to warfare and beyond. Boyd was a fighter pilot in the Korean War, and as well as literally writing the book on air-to-air -air combat techniques, he co-developed a model of aircraft performance called energy maneuverability theory. And this theory was used to develop, amongst other things, the F-16 fighter jet. Boyd is also credited for largely developing the strategy for the invasion of Iraq in the Gulf War in 1991. So it's safe to say that he's a, he's a big thinker. And throughout his career, he was interested in understanding how it was that people made the decisions that they made and how this translated into success. Bear in mind that Boyd was thinking from the scale of individual fighter pilots in dogfights all the way through to large-scale military campaigns. And it was this pursuit that led him to develop the UDAR loop. And here is Boyd's UDAR loop, or one version of it. Um, it's quite a complicated picture here. It's not, it's not my picture. Um, but at its simplest, we're looking at a four-step loop here. You've got your observe, orient, decide, and act. And the idea is that you begin by observing a situation. You use the information that you've observed to orient yourself. You make a decision, and then you enact that decision. And of course, it's a loop. So once you go around once, you're not done. You go back to the beginning, and you carry on. In reality, there's much more to it than that. And I think the complexity in this diagram tries to capture this. There's no need to enact the full loop at each step. You can short circuit back to the beginning at any point. And there's a lot of nuance to what's occurring that um, unfortunately it goes beyond what I've got time to talk to you about today, but it's, it is very interesting. <laughs> so the only thing that I'd like to add that isn't represented on this diagram that's important to the concept of the UDA loop is the idea of tempo. So it's not just the process of looping that's beneficial. Um, it, it also matters how quickly you can loop. And if you think about a, co a conflict situation, it's not just you that's going through this loop, but your adversary is as well. And if you can loop at a higher tempo than your opponent, you can potentially make multiple actions before your opponent has even responded to your first. This is a really important aspect of this process, and it's called looping your opponent. 
if you can get to the point where you're looping them, it's much harder for them to get accurate information at this observe step, which makes it harder for them to orient, and it, it, it just throws them off completely. And this gives you an edge. So hang on a second. We're looking at quick loops and rapid feedback and fast iterations, and this is kind of all starting to sound familiar, right? It's kind of starting to sound like agile, and that's actually no coincidence. So Agile promotes iterative, incremental, and evolutionary working. And if we recall our UDAR loop, that's exactly the mechanism at play. We loop, in each loop we make changes, we measure the impact of those changes, and we loop again. We want to be able to react to new information, new learnings, and changes in the environment. Jeff Sutherland, the co-inventor of the Scrum development process and one of the initial signatories of the Agile Manifesto, was in fact a Top Gun fighter pilot. He then went on to become a doctor of medicine before moving into the software development world. And he had this to say about Scrum. UDA is the mindset of Scrum. UDA is the mindset of Scrum. So we're not just looking at a similarity here. Scrum is actually an application of the UDA loop to the software development process. And I think that's something that's really important to keep in mind. So when we think about the various ceremonies and practices that we employ in our pursuit of being agile, at its heart, we're trying to exploit the UDAR loop to our advantage. And if we go back to our dev and ops teams that we were looking at earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, we can start to visualize some of what I'm talking about. And before I do, I just want to clarify that at any given time within an organization, and indeed within each team, there might be many different loops in flight. I'm choosing an arbitrary example here. I'm not trying to say that this single loop captures the full set of nuances of the, in of the relationship between every dev and ops team. But let's look at what one loop might look like. So you start with your observe, <clears throat> orient, decide, and then act. Here we have the ops team making of observations, feeding the results of those observations back to the dev team, who orient themselves based on this information, make a decision, and then push some resulting action over to the ops team. In reality, I suspect we could put any combination of the OO DNA across the two teams, and it would accurately model some scenario but this one, this one will serve our purposes nicely. And what you can see here, and if you remember that at this point in time we had an inter-organizational boundary between these teams, what you can see here is that every, for every single iteration of this loop, we're crossing that boundary twice. And if we're being generous, we're probably looking at two queues here as the work gets handed off between the teams Two at the, at the very least. In reality, there's probably even more delay in the system than that. And this is going to be true of any loop that involves these two teams. And that's going to be pretty much every loop that results in the delivery of some software or change. OK, so I'm sure some of you are waiting for me to state the obvious here. And yes, if we want to increase the tempo at which we can get through this loop, there's a relatively simple answer. And I, I, think, I think we all know what that is. So let's remove those cues. And let's get those two separate teams together. But just before we do, I want to bring control and responsibility into this as well. So you can see for this loop where the control lies, <coughs> because we've got a D that stands for decide down here. And that's our decision making. I've just realized this looks a little bit like an eye test, and I do apologize if you can't really see the difference between the O and the D. Um, if you're struggling, come and see me afterwards, and we'll get your prescription updated. So, <laughs> Bad joke. So where's our responsibility in this? Where's the obligation? In this hypothetical, I think maybe the ops team are ob observing because they're expected to main maintain some level of performance, and they have to be the ones who act because they have permissions to update the relevant configuration. So, so maybe that's our obligation in this case. I don't think the loop itself carries enough information to show you where the responsibility is. But wherever there is a loop, there must be someone responsible for it. So, here we go. We've created our DevOps team, we've removed those queues, and we've removed the wait time that we have to go around for a, we have to, <coughs> sorry, that we have to go through for a single loop. But we did something else when we brought those two teams together. We brought the control and responsibility for this loop together as well. And that might seem like a subtle distinction, or maybe I'm stating the obvious, but I think it's, it's really important to appreciate that we've done this. So not only can we start looping at a higher tempo, because we no longer have that waiting, but we've also taken two teams who've been feeling frustrated with their respective lack of control. and We've aligned that control and responsibility so that they, as a single unit, own the entire loop. 
We're both increasing our potential tempo and aligning our control and responsibility. I asked at the beginning of the talk, why is DevOps so successful? And I, th I think this is a fundamental aspect of that success. We had teams that were trying to be agile. They were observing the ceremonies and they were going through the motions. And agile highlighted these loops and it brought them into the foreground. But we still had issues between these teams, not only in terms of speed, but in terms of how work was handed over and how ownership was allocated. And DevOps provides an answer and, and an effective one. The other question I asked was, where do we go from here? And to answer that, I think we need to think about what we're trying to achieve overall. <coughs> so I mentioned that there are several loops in flight at once. And in reality, I think we also have loops within loops. So each level of our organization, from our strategic goals set by the board to the individual tasks performed by engineers, are going through these UDAR loops at different levels of abstraction. I think it's loops all the way down. And the loop we're looking at here is a loop within the technology division. And I think it's often the technology loop that's seen as the constraint. So when we have release cycles of maybe once every nine months, you can see why people get that impression. And it's often the truth. Both Agile and, and <coughs> excuse me, both Agile and DevOps try to tackle the problem of the time it takes to get around this loop. And with the goal, uh, <coughs> sorry, with the goal of increasing our tempo. If our technology loop is the constraint in delivering business value, in Scrum, the sanctity of the sprint isolates that constraint. And with DevOps teams, we elevate that constraint. As a slight aside, when we consider that the effectiveness of the UDAR loop is based on the relative tempo between competitors, you can see how even month-long sprints were hugely effective when everyone was releasing once a year. But as people move towards shorter cycles, it gets harder and harder to keep that edge. But the real goal isn't to increase the tempo of this technology loop. Even what we normally consider technology businesses are rarely in the business of technology. And what really matters is the tempo of that business loop. What do our customers need? How do we position ourselves in the market to survive? What should we be doing? And technology is definitely a part of this loop, but it's not the only loop. And critically, it's a loop inside the larger business loop. The sales and marketing, finance, security, many others all involved with the aim of delivering our business goals. And it's those business loops that are the ones that matter. What we need to be doing is to make sure that as a team, as a division, as an organization, we're enabling our business loops to re reach the highest tempo that they can. And we're starting to see moves in this direction, aren't we? So we've got our dev and our ops. And actually, I just want to call something out at this point because I think some of our colleagues have been sidelined a little bit here. If we're looking at pulling different functions together, people didn't really bat an eyelid when we pulled the dev and QA function together because it made so much sense. And when you see places where they're still separate, you do get all those same frustrations and problems that we've just been through when the dev and ops teams are separate. So we have dev and ops and QA. And I think I mentioned some others as well. And now maybe we're starting to represent a single business loop. So am I advocating Sal, Biz, Bin? No, I can't, I can't even say it. No, um, I'm not. What I'm trying to say is that that is probably taking the idea ad absurdum. Um, but if we focus on the underlying idea, which is that what's important are these business loops and the tempo of these business loops, and that we can look at bringing together control and responsibility within these loops to help us achieve this. And, and it doesn't just give us that increase in tempo because we get these morale improvements as well. We can see that we've removed those frustrations and that in itself is a worthy goal. People become satisfied and engaged with their work. The fact that they align with our wider goal of delivering a successful business is just a win-win. So let's just go away and restructure our organizations. Let's get right on it. Um, <laughs> maybe we can do what Michael Cote mentioned this morning and just set up a brand new organization. Obviously, there's a cost involved in what I'm talking about. And as much as I'm talking about this as, a, as if it's some sort of panacea that's going to solve all your problems, it won't. But it's a way to solve a certain class of problem. We, we know now that if we bring together the control and responsibility, we can move much faster. We have much more satisfied and engaged team members as we do so. 
And control and responsibility is broader than just organizing teams within your business. I'd like to take some time to talk through some other examples of this and demonstrate this concept is broader than just, just our organizational structure. So I'm going to go slightly off script um, for a minute. Was anyone at um, Marcus Bartrak's talk on Prometheus earlier? Anybody? Anybody? I haven't quite hit the overlap of those two groups of people. Um, uh, Marcus gave a great talk on Prometheus, and, it, and he mentioned how fastly improved their monitoring culture by pushing their control and responsibility for monitoring into each team rather than relying on an external team of SREs to own everyone's monitoring. Um, something that might have been a cross-cutting concern was actually moved into the teams, and it had a really great effect. And I thought that was quite a nice illustration of, of this principle at work. Um, have, have we got software developers in the room at all? Uh, do people, if I, if I say the actor model, do people know what I'm talking about? A few, a few heads nodding. So the actor model is a pattern for handling concurrent computation. And the standard object-oriented approach would be to encapsulate your state within an object. You then have these external threads of execution coming along, reading that state, and maybe mutating it along the way. These threads are operating concurrently, so the object has to protect itself. To put it another way, it has an obligation to maintain the correctness of its state. But the decisions of when things are happening are made by these external threads. Cue the introduction of locks, mutexes, synchronization, and watch the complexity of that object explode. The actor model flips this around and says, fine, come along and ask me to do things. But I'm the one who's going to be doing them. And typically, this is modeled with an internal thread. So the only reading and writing of that internal state is now done by the object itself. We've taken that control and pulled it into the place where we have responsibility. That's, that's quite neat, right? And what about a microservices architecture? So traditionally, you might have several different layers of an application belonging to different teams, maybe a UI layer, processing layer, a data layer. And the data layer might serve several different business functions. And microservices turn that around and say, OK, I'll deliver this capability for you, but I own my API. I own my storage. I don't have to go to another team to ask them to restructure my data when I change my query patterns or let someone else steal all the CPU cycles from my processing, because we happen to be deployed in the same container. We're pulling the control and responsibility for a single business capability together into one place, where previously it was spread around. Hopefully, I'm talking some sort of sense here. OK, um, let's get out of the software world entirely and think about accommodation, um, particularly renting versus home ownership. And actually, in an ideal world, I think both these scenarios represent a balance between control and responsibility. We can put renting maybe down here, and home ownership might be somewhere up here. When you're renting, you give that control and responsibility of aspects of maintaining your accommodation over to your landlord. This explains why people can be just as happy renting as owning. If you don't want to deal with things, let somebody else do it. But too often you hear people get frustrated with their situation when they're renting, and typically it's because the landlord isn't living up to their responsibility. So the rent is actually sitting over here somewhere, and the landlord's quite happy up here. Home ownership removes the possibility of that disconnect, because it takes you from here and it brings the control up. But it's perfectly possible to have a good landlord and be happy, you know, sitting down here as well. What I'm, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that you can see that this misalignment of control and responsibility manifests in quite a few different places. And a lot of the time, the way to fix the situation is to bring them back into alignment. And if you take one thing away from this talk, I, I hope it's this. I can't count the number of times my wife and I have been talking about issues at our respective work, and one of us twigs and says, oh, it's control and responsibility again. So I, I asked where we can go from here, and, and I think, I think there's, there's something that we can use here as well. So we can keep our eyes open for signs of frustration and look for cases where we've got responsibility without control. Maybe you won't be able to make the change to resolve it, but the first step has to be identifying the issue and then being able to articulate it. Um, I've got a few other examples as well, and I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't go back to the military since that's where this came from. Um, is it a coincidence that the UDAR loop came out of a fighter pilot's head? 
I'm, I'm not sure that it is. I think fighter pilots probably sit kind of all the way up here, right? Imagine if you had to radio some control station to be told that you could bank or climb when you're in the middle of combat. How long do you think you'd last against an opponent who is making their own decisions? David Marquette wrote an excellent book, Turn the Ship Around. I don't know if people have read that one. In it, he talks about his struggle to turn followers into leaders aboard a nuclear submarine. And a large part of what he did to achieve this was to make sure that the decisions were being made in the right places by the right people. Everything didn't need to bubble up all the way up to the top of the chain of command. He took people who were down here and he moved them up here. And when he did this, his submarine went from amongst the worst performing in the fleet to being the best. Okay, and I'm really philosophizing a bit here, but think about how effective in politics the expression taking back control is. I think it immediately puts you somewhere down here and promises to elevate you somewhere up here. Okay, I've rattled through this quite quickly, but I'm, I'm actually getting close to wrapping up here. Um, <laughs> I could ramble a lot more at this point, but I've covered most of the meat of what I want to go through. And before I wrap up, I just want to go back to Viktor Frankl and man's search for meaning. He says that logotherapy sees in responsibleness the very essence of human existence. I'll say that again. Logotherapy sees in responsibleness the very essence of human existence. And remember, logotherapy is about a search for meaning. And Frankl claims that we find meaning with responsibleness. So I hope I've made a strong argument that control or freedom and responsibility really do go hand in hand. So as responsibility increases, so should freedom. And if that is the very essence of human existence, I think we can add one more annotation to this graph. I, I think we can call this line meaning. And finally, I'll leave you with this. Viktor Frankl also says that freedom is in danger of degenerating into mere arbitrariness unless it is lived in terms of responsibleness. That is why I recommend that the Statue of Liberty on the East Coast of the United States be supplemented by a Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast. He did. There is actually a foundation dedicated towards doing this. Um, it's, it's really, really interesting. The Statue of Liberty on the East Coast be supplemented by a Statue of Responsibility on the West. Liberty and Responsibility. Thanks very much for listening.